Impunity is when people in power do whatever they want without facing any consequences. And it's most obvious when they commit crimes and get away with it. This is especially true for some local warlords and their families in the Philippines who use their power to do corrupt things and never get punished. In fact, in the Philippines, about 70% of local leaders are part of these powerful families. A shocking event known as the Maguindanao Massacre really opened the nation's eyes. It brought attention to many long-standing issues that everyone knew about but hadn't really dealt with. This tragic event saw 58 people killed in broad daylight by the very people who were supposed to be their leaders and protectors, including local officials and police. Since learning about this case, my perception of the region has been forever changed. Whenever I see Empatuan marked in Maguindanao on the map of the Philippines, it's as if the place has taken on a different, more somber light. It's no longer just a name on a map, it's a reminder of a dark chapter in history. Today, let's take a look at the case, which stands as the worst example of political violence in the Philippines, and is also the deadliest attack on journalists. On the afternoon of November 23rd, 2009, around 1.30 p.m., a helicopter touched down on a hilltop in Sitio Masale, Maguindanao, located in the southern part of the Philippines. The Philippine army responding to a kidnapping report was unaware that they had arrived at the scene of a horrific massacre. What they found was a scene of utter brutality. The scene was strewn with numerous bodies, each bloodied and riddled with bullets left on the ground. The arrival of the helicopter alerted the perpetrators, and they stopped burying their victims in shallow graves and fled the scene. In total, 58 people had been mercilessly gunned down. The assailants were members of the local police force and the private army of the influential Empatuan clan. The victims included the wife, two sisters, and relatives of a man named Ismail Toto Mangutadatu, along with his supporters and 32 journalists. They were part of a convoy on its way to file his certificate of candidacy for the highest office in the province. Tragically, the convoy also included motorists who were unrelated to this political event and were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. None of them reached their intended destination, falling victim to this tragic and politically motivated act of violence. A gang of armed men stopped and forced them to a hilltop in the village of Masale, where they were repeatedly shot. 58 people were killed and buried in a mass grave. Toto Mangudadatu, then the vice mayor of Buluan, decided to run for governor against Datu Andal and Patuan Jr. He was the mayor of Unse and the son of the powerful Empatuan patriarch, Andal Sr. The Empatuan family, ruling the struggling region of southern Maguindanao for nearly a decade, had strong connections with the then president of the Philippines. Four months before the tragedy, the Empatuans met in a hotel where the patriarch declared that Toto had to be eliminated because he was set on running for governor directly challenging his son, Datu Andal Jr., who is also known as Datu Unse. Datu Zaldi, another son of the patriarch and then governor of the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, agreed. He stressed the need to carefully plan this event to avoid getting caught, which could ruin their reputation and lead to imprisonment. Datu Unse made it very clear that anyone trying to take power from the Empatuans, especially the Mangudadatus, deserved to die. 
Toto sensed that there could be violence, resistance. So in response to this threat, Toto devised a plan. He believed that Muslim traditions would prevent his rivals from attacking women, and that the presence of journalists would deter the Ampatuans from acting openly aggressive. So he asked his wife, Jenlin, to lead a group of supporters, including his two sisters, Eden and Farina, and other relatives, in a convoy to file his certificate for candidacy. To give you a little more background about the Impatuan family, the family had been ruling Maguindanao since 2001. They were known for their strong grip on power, even having their private army. And impressively, 18 of Maguindanao's mayors were from the Impatuan clan. Despite the province being one of the poorest in the country, with many living in shacks and wooden houses, the Impatuans were incredibly wealthy. They owned 161 properties, including over 20 large mansions in affluent areas across the country. Over the past 20 years, the Impatuans were linked to at least 56 killings, not even including the Maguindanao massacre. Their use of violence to maintain control and get rid of any threats was well known and feared in their territories. Before the massacre, residents of Sicho Masale sensed something was wrong because of the sudden appearance of multiple checkpoints in the area. It was clear that the massacre was a well-planned and organized act. On the morning of November 23rd, around 5 a.m., a convoy gathered at the house of Toto Mangudadatu's brothers, who was an assemblyman. Toto was in Buluan, a nearby town, and asked them to wait for him. But his wife, Janelin, decided that if Toto didn't arrive by 9 a.m., they would proceed to the election office in Sharif Aguak. Keeping in close contact, Janelin informed Toto that they had reached the crossing Zanyak checkpoint, but they were stopped by armed men, police officers, and commanders. And as the convoy continued towards Malating, it was stopped again by Datu Kanur Abatuan and Mayor Sukarno Dikay, the police chief inspector. They ordered everyone out of the vehicles. A red Toyota Vios, not originally part of the convoy, but on its way to Cotabato City Hospital, was also stopped and included. Unsei, who was keeping track of the convoy's progress via radio, confirmed that the road was completely blocked. Shortly after, Decay reported to Unsei that the convoy was unarmed and mostly comprised of women. Datu Kanora then called in his armed men. They rushed to the vehicles and ordered the passengers to lie face down on the ground. Datu Unsei soon arrived in a black vehicle, accompanied by police cars and a Hummer armed with a firearm. The armed men began assaulting the people, hitting them with the butts of their firearms, punching, kicking, and knocking their heads and slapping them. Toto's sister Eden and his wife Jenelin were brought before Datu Unsei. He took Jenelin's bag and found the document for filing the candidacy. And during this tense situation, Jenelin managed to make a frantic phone call to Toto. She told him that they were stopped by over a hundred armed men in uniforms on the highway. And the call was abruptly cut off. And when she managed to call again, she was distressed and mentioned that Unsei was nearby and had slapped her. And that was the last time Toto heard from his wife. The group was then driven up to the mountains, stopping on a hilltop in Sicho Masale between 10 and 11 a.m. All passengers were forced out of their vehicles. Janelin and Eden were brought before Unze again and were among the first to be shot. Janelin was shot 17 times, according to the autopsy report, with a witness confirming that Datu Unse shot her between the legs. After the shooting, Unse called his father to report the success of their operation against the Maguta Datus, mentioning that only the media members remained alive. His father instructed him to eliminate everyone. So from around 11.30 a.m. to noon, the massacre continued. The sounds of gunshots echoed, even reaching the nearby towns. Some of the severely wounded passengers were dragged in front of Unsei 
and shot again, despite their pleas for mercy. Passengers in the vehicle who had refused to leave and hid inside were shot inside their van. Datu Ulo, Datu Ipi, who were Unze's nephews, and their henchmen even turned the killing into a grim contest, competing to see who could kill the most passengers. The shooting spree, which lasted over an hour, was rapid and loud. About 15 minutes after the shooting started, Unse was warned that soldiers were approaching. He quickly radioed the backhoe operator to hurry up with burying the bodies and the vehicles of the victims. Around noon, a backhoe was used to dig a large pit for the bodies. The operator, Bong Andal, explained that the vehicles were the first to be placed in the pit, which he then crushed with the backhoe's arm. And after that, the bodies were added on top of it. Meanwhile, Toto Manguta Datu was frantically trying to reach his family. He managed to get a helicopter with the help of a colonel. From the air, they could see the backhoe digging pits, but they were too afraid to land because they feared that they would be shot by the armed men on the hilltop. The police later recovered bullet-ridden bodies from the shallow graves, while troops searched for the gunmen who had escaped. In total, 57 bodies and 13 vehicles were uncovered. The victims included 32 media personnel, 20 of Toto's relatives and supporters, and six motorists who were not even part of the convoy. The military faced challenges in conducting its investigation into the massacre, despite the large number of victims and overwhelming evidence because of the immense power and influence of the Impatuans. The situation changed when the Philippine government declared a state of emergency in Maguindanao, which allowed the military to raid and seize the Impatuans' firearms. This action led the Impatuan's private army, comprising nearly 5,000 civilian volunteers, to flee and hide in the mountains. Four days after the massacre, Unse surrendered, but denied involvement, blaming an unarmed Islamic group instead. He was charged with murder on December 1, 2009. The Mangudadatu family accused Andal Sr. of being the mastermind behind this crime, with Unse as the main gunman and several other Impatuans as primary suspects. Charges were filed on December 15, 2009. To expedite the process, the Supreme Court instructed the judges to use judicial affidavits instead of direct testimonies from witnesses. Two key witnesses, former Vice Mayor Sukarno Badal and House Help Lakmodin Salio, identified the Impatuan brothers as killers and conspirators, with Patriarch Andel Sr. as the mastermind. Mayor Ahmed Impatuan, Andel Sr.'s nephew, also testified, admitting his involvement in the planning. The trial began in January 2010, with 134 witnesses for the prosecution. Key witnesses reported hearing the Impatuans planned the killing as early as July 2009 and as late as November 19, 2009, just days before the massacre. So in total, 197 individuals, including members of the Impatuan clan, were charged with murder. Seven of the accused died during the trial and Andal Sr. passed away from liver cancer in 2015. 11 were released on bail, while 8 had their cases dismissed or were released. 90 suspects were detained at Camp Bagong Diwa in Taguig City. For the families of the victims, seeking justice has been a tough and heart-wrenching journey. They felt neglected by the government and sensed a lack of concern from the public. This battle for justice stretched over 10 long years. Throughout the trial, witnesses faced numerous challenges as well. Many were offered bribes to change their stories. Most witnesses were threatened or even killed one after another. A few of them withdrew their statements under this pressure. In December 2019, a full decade after this horrific mass murder, the Quezon City Regional Trial Court delivered a verdict. The court convicted 28 individuals, including Datu Unse and Zaldi, for 57 counts of murder. They were sentenced to reclusion perpetua, which means up to 40 years of imprisonment without parole.
But they were not convicted for the 58th murder because the body of the victim, Ronaldo Mombe, had not been found. Only his dentures were discovered at the crime scene. So the fight continues for his official recognition as a victim. The families of the victims noted that several of those implicated in the massacre have been released and have even returned to politics. Over 50 accused were acquitted and around 80 suspects, including 15 Empatuans identified by witnesses as actual shooters, remain at large. Some of these suspects are believed to still be involved in criminal activities, including targeting members of the Mangudadato family and other victims' families. The battle for justice is far from over, as the Empatuans have appealed the ruling. On the 14th anniversary of the Maguindanao massacre, Datu Unse was found guilty of 21 graft charges and sentenced to up to 210 years in jail. He was ordered to pay 44 million and is permanently disqualified from holding any public office. And four days after the massacre, Toto traveled the same road where the attack occurred to file his candidacy. He won the 2010 election for Maguindanao governor and served until 2019. In the 2019 elections, he was elected as a congressman and currently serves as vice chairperson of the House Committees on Local Government, Mindanao Affairs, and National Defense and Security. The Empatuan clan continues to wield significant influence over Maguindanao province. For Toto and the families of other victims, there remains a constant fear for their safety as the threat of retaliation and further attacks looms. Until all 80 suspects are arrested, they may never find peace. The region is marred by numerous incidents of violence, many of which go unpunished. This unchecked abuse of power is particularly rampant in these provinces. The Maguindanao massacre triggered a widespread demand for an end to the prevailing culture of impunity in these areas. Let us honor the memory of those lost by continuing to advocate for justice, transparency, and the protection of democratic values, ensuring that such a tragedy never occurs again. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching.